I showed up again, as promised. It's the 25th of September. Can you believe three months until Christmas? Wow. Hope you're doing okay. Nobody seems to be up for small talk due to lack of commentary here. The comments are open. I haven't seen anybody knocking around, so I presume it's just me and the one or two. Tonight we reach Chapter 5 of Ideas Have Legs by Peter Howard. And without further ado, I think we should... Get this show on the road. Chapter 5. That's our book, by the way. Chapter 5. Lord Beaverbrook Breaks a Horse. Success was my aim. I sought it through power and I sought it through money. I lived to manhood at a time when most young men like myself believed that our first duty to ourselves, our families, and our nation was to get ourselves along in the world. But did we get the world along? I, for one, never stopped to think what sort of nation would be produced by millions of individuals all selfishly elbowing, manoeuvring, and tearing each other's throats to obtain for themselves a larger cut off the national joint. In the poem, the old farmer gives his son this advice. I don't say marry for money, but go where the money is. I went where the money was. I worked for Lord Beaverbrook in Fleet Street. Lord Beaverbrook has an eye, like a harpoon. It transvixes and imprisons. Once at a dinner party I felt it were a stab in my blubber, and, turning, saw that I was hooked and held in this whale-wise manner. Peter, said Beaverbrook, you should write some paragraphs for the Evening Standard on the subject of accents, the way in which different men pronounce different words. Lord Curzon, for example, the late and great, I mean, he always used to pronounce the word dance as though it rhymed with pants. Then you might say Lord Beaverbrook always calls the horse race the derby, except when he remembers to call it the derby. At this point a friend of Lord Beaverbrook's, a woman of intelligence and courage, remarked, Peter, you will be nearer the truth if you say Max always calls it the Derby, except when he remembers to call it the Derby. Lord Beaverbrook's Canadian accent is something which he cherishes. He takes pains to retain it, after more than thirty years of life in England. Indeed, his Canadian accent is so fetching that it is catching, and this imitation gives him much delight, coupled with a secret and cynical amusement. Lord Beaverbrook had a friend. His name was Rudyard Kipling. Lord Beaverbrook, studying and admiring the art of his friend, decided that he himself must learn to write stout and active prose. Lord Beaverbrook in early life was a chemist's assistant. He still delights to call for a bottle and to demonstrate to the astonished guests how he can hold it round the waist and at the same time, with the same hand, pluck the cork from its neck. By the age of twenty-five, he had carved an immense fortune. He crossed the Atlantic to a strange land, entered Parliament, became the instrument to kill a government, which seemed at that time imperishable, and to establish Lloyd George's war-winning administration. Then he became a baron. And it is a sign of Lord Beaverbrook's strength and balance that with all his achievement and ability, he was not too proud to go back to school again. He sat doggedly under Rudyard Kipling. From this friend, with resolution, he learned to think in ink, to write prose. His style today is an artificial one, but forthright and distinctive. Like his accent, it is catching. One Thursday evening, Lord Beaverbrook, a man whose hand I once had shaken, telephoned to me at the solicitor's office where then I worked. He asked me to go and see him. As soon as I got inside the room, he said, I want you to write a political article for me. 
this was the first I knew of the proposition. Just the same, I did write that article and continued to write them for seven rich years. Money could not buy the education Beaver Brook gave me. He had no use for unwilling steeds. The willing ones he flogged and fed, spurred and broke, groomed and trained until the cart horse was transmogrified into the race horse. The unwilling ones silently trotted away or were dispatched by the humane killer. I have known tears in my early pearly days with Beaverbrook. How often have I seen the article on which my sweat had fallen held in those small hands of power, then page after page dropping on the floor among the rubbish of the morning's correspondence, while that harsh, pungent voice tore each sentence to confetti. I calculate that for the first two years I worked in the express I did every article which appeared in the newspaper at least four times over, and how many were there which were written and rewritten half a score of times, and then never appeared in print at all. Lord Beaverbrook, gazing over his spectacles with his blue eyes after a most careful reading of the whole article, Peter, did you write this? Listen, folks, I know this isn't a Canadian accent, but hey, <clears throat> bear with, bear with. Myself, hopefully. Yes, I did, Lord Beaverbrook. Did you write every word of it yourself, without help from anyone at all? Myself, jubilantly. Yes, I did, Lord Beaverbrook. Mm, dropping the article on the floor. You know, Peter, I can't believe it of a fellow like you. It's so damned bad. Now go upstairs, you'll find a typewriter there, and do it all over again. At two o'clock in the morning, my telephone bell has rung me to life. Uh, Peter, w would you like to do a little work? Yes, sir. Well, we want an article for today's evening standard. Uh, are you in bed? Yes, sir. Well, on with your clothes. There's a good boy. Do your article and read it over the phone to me here in an hour or so. Then you can take it down to the office first thing in the morning for the lunch edition. Never was so cursable a man as Beaverbrook, so lovable. When I had the operation for an infected and impacted wisdom tooth, he sent his valet, Albert, to sit in my darkened bedroom with warm chicken broth. He telephoned my wife, Doey, in the country and told her to come home, Im to come home instantly. She arrived in a great buffle, thinking I was dying. He sent me a mass of luxuriant flowers, the three Baba Bloom variety. A few days later he suggested I should write an article. I crawled out of bed and did it. Then I taxied to Beaverbrook's London home. Beaverbrook didn't like the start of the article. The end of it seemed weak to him, and the middle made him boil and bubble. He told me so in exact terms. It was a bitter November day. I trudged off through the wet and cold toward St. James's Square. Then behind me I heard a scurry and patter. There was Lord Beaverbrook, a small asthmatic figure, coatless and hatless, trotting after me. Uh, Peter, he said, forgive me, I shouldn't speak to you like that. You, you'll think no more of it. They say that emperors of old, fearful of the venom of their enemies, dosed themselves with poison in ever-increasing quantities until they became immu immunized. Lord Beaverbrook is a carrot and stick man. He knows better than any fellow I have met how best to drive men on by alternating doses of blame and praise. His blame is sometimes extravagant. His praise... Usually so. But at the end of seven years of this sort of process, you become, in the words of the song, a little bit independent, just a little bit immunized, like the Roman emperors against both kinds of drug. The old limbs do not jerk so instantly into action at the blame, nor do they put on so heart-wrenching a spurt at the praise. And all that memory leaves behind in, in a sense of affection and gratitude. 
by and large, it was more fun than fury. During those seven years, my objective was to please my boss. It would be foolish to deny that I succeeded. During the seven years I worked with him, my salary was multiplied by six. Money, money, money. The great god. Pounds, shillings, and pence. A lady jumped over the fence. She slipped on her belly and thought it was jelly. Pounds, shillings, and pence. I just put that bit in to make sure you're awake. I worked, schemed, and fought for it. I was one of a mighty interwar army of British citizens who spent the greater part of their lives struggling by kicks or kisses to extract a, a rise in pay from their employers. I was so set on pleasing my boss that I did not greatly care whether I displeased some others in the process, provided those I displeased had nothing to offer me and could do me no harm. Sometimes my hot anger against conditions flared up in genuine resentment against our public men. I had seen so much misery and poverty in our midst, while the fat and the rich still flourished. Some public men made fine speeches on public platforms, but when I met them in private, they seemed ineffective, complacent, and even indifferent. I yearned and strove to scold them into action. Being myself by nature extremely sensitive to criticism, I was able to diagnose to the millimetre the most tender spots in the anatomy of other people. Some of them used to yelp to Lord Beaverbrook for sympathy. If they were of sufficient importance, he would give them their sympathy, and give me a rise in pay. So my resentment against our politicians paid dividends. Sometimes the newspaper's policy had to be advocated by folk like myself, even if I did not wholly endorse it. But my highly paid job meant more to me than my scruples. I signed my name to many views which I at most but half believed. I suppose in my seven years of political and leader writing, I told more people what to do or what to stop doing than any other political journalist. I made a name and I made money for myself. That was my aim and my achievement. Yet I cannot recall any man of power who, to suit my written observations, modified or changed his conduct by a particle. I had no answer for the man of power, and to be frank, the men of power had no answer for me. They gave no leadership of the quality to match the age. They left me either hot with rage or cold with indifference. Their lives, on the whole, seemed to be based on the same motives of personal ambition as my own, while the cures they propounded for the ills of the nation were based on the belief that more money for somebody would put everything right. That was my belief, and I was the somebody. As I and my generation tried with varying success to carve out a position in life, the shadows were lengthening across Europe. On the continent, young men with clubs and castor oil, with Gestapo and Ogpu, with purges and liquidations, were smashing aside every human barrier which stood between them and the fulfilment of their big ideas. I, and millions like me in Britain, had our own ideas. Many of them were on the whole. Well-meaning and well-intended. But above all, we wanted to be left alone, to be allowed to get on with our job of getting on. For a long time, we hoped we could answer tanks by talk, disruption by a disapproval, and passion by penmanship. Some of the things I and my generation believed in were the good and the right things. But being right is both smug and inadequate in a world where those whose idea it is to establish wrong are on the march. What I and my generation never learned was how to establish right. We did not understand how to make what is right the strongest idea in the world. We never faced or paid the cost of making ideals effective. Some of, 
Some of us thought we could couple the theory of high ideals with the practice of low living. So the idea of democracy, which is the name we in Britain gave to our idea, became debased. It lost the character of true democracy. It surrendered the initiative to those forces in the world which worked and lived for the spreading of their anti-democratic ideas among all nations by means of force and revolution. As a nation, we lightly skipped over our own mistakes while urging other nations by means of pious pronouncements to become different. This method has never influenced me when it has been applied to me, nor did it influence the other nations. Meanwhile, I, and millions like me, continued to disapprove of much that went on, but failed to do anything effective about it. We booed from the back seat, while the world charabanc was driven over the precipice by those who desired a crash. Am I going to talk to you? No, because it's bedtime and you're supposed to be winding down. Like and subscribe if you want. I would, you know, feedback would be good. But as I said, I'm in for the long haul. I committed to this and, and I'm just going to have to stick with it, folks. I'm finding it quite interesting, actually. I am finding it interesting. It may not be a bang, bang, shoot 'em up kind of novel, but it certainly is thought-provoking. Hmm. So, make it a date tomorrow night for chapter six. Bye.